Good afternoon, everybody. We'll be starting here in five seconds. We have a lot of ground to cover today. I just want to make sure everybody has a chance to get their audio connected and logged in before we truly kick off. Well, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today for a discussion with Lee Huntsman, President Emeritus of University of Washington, and Dr. Nuando Anyoku, Chief Health Equity Officer for Swedish Health Services. My name is Nick Jackal, and I serve as the Community Engagement Director at Cambia Grove. A bit of housekeeping at the top. Uh, throughout the discussion today, please use the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen to send in your questions our way. We will hold about 15 minutes at the end to get through as many of your questions as possible. This event is being recorded, as you can see, and the recording will be made available on our website in a few days. You will also receive a link to the recap in our Thursday newsletter of this week. At Cambia Grove, we serve as a catalyst to transform healthcare towards a more person-focused and economically sustainable system. We do this through collaboration with the five points of healthcare, patients, payers, providers, policymakers, and purchasers, as well as with other aligned stakeholders and innovators. Our goal is to drive transformation by optimizing three ecosystem elements of the healthcare system, infrastructure, incentives, and culture. To the surprise of no one in this room, systemic racism and health disparities are a pernicious barrier inhibiting equitable transformations. Today's discussion highlights the incredible career and character of Dr. Anyoku and the essential work she and her team lead at Swedish. It is now my pleasure to introduce our regular host for Under the Bows, Lee Huntsman. Welcome, Lee. Thank you, Nick, and hello, everyone. Dr. Anyoko, welcome to you, and thank you so much for being with us to share in this important topic. We're really looking forward to learning about health equity and your aspirations for it at Swedish. But maybe before we begin, uh, I want to ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself and your professional journey, and how you come to this point. Hello, Lee. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and this conversation is so very important. My professional journey has been one that's been on for a bit. I'm a pediatrician by training. Um, I went to medical school. I was born and, and went to medical school in West Africa and um, came to the United States about 30 years ago. And sort of my background and my where, where I originally trained really emphasized the importance of thinking about healthcare solutions on behalf of populations, on behalf of larger bodies of people. So when I came to the United States, I actually went and, uh, to do a master's in public health at Johns Hopkins University. And that's kind of been my, my journey, always while providing excellent individual care, but thinking about how do I put solutions in place that solve the needs of larger groups of people, of populations? How can you do one thing that, that changes the lives of many people? And so I um, worked in the East Coast for a couple of decades and then started moving West like all good Americans do and um, paused briefly in um, Omaha, Nebraska uh, where I worked with CHI uh, building their pediatric primary care network and then landed in Swedish as a lead for pediatric primary care and ultimately the PEDS enterprise. And my, my work, like I said, focuses on advocating for, the, for those who don't have a voice um, so children are the, the, <laughs> the epitome of that. Um, but in the wake of the um, unrest, the murder of George Floyd in 2020 and the, the onset of the pandemic, which really uncovered very long standing inequities in our health system, uh, Providence and Joseph's Health, which is our parent organization, made a commitment to work on health equity specifically over the next uh, few years. And so I started to lead some of that work at Swedish and six months ago was named the inaugural health, chief health equity officer for Swedish health systems. And it really allows me to bring to bear my experience as a clinician, as a physician leader, but also as an advocate for, for populations. And so that's kind of what brings me here today. Oh, <laughs> what a wonderful <laughs> journey. <laughs> Wonderful journey. Now let's start maybe with the big picture. Health equity as a phrase is more common among us now than it was uh, not long ago. But I wonder uh, what is the general conception of what we mean when we say health, health equity and, and how much consensus is there about that? There's, there's quite a bit of consensus now that we are talking about it. 
Um, so health equity really, there's a more form, I'll give you a formal definition and then a, a less, a more <laughs> synchronized one. It talks about the, uh, it, it speaks to the absence of disparities in healthcare and, and its determinants between groups of people. And, um, you know, to attain health equity means to close the gap in health between populations that, you know, that have different characteristics. So your more concise definition is optimal health outcomes, regardless of your background. So everybody should be able to get the same health outcomes, regardless of where they're starting from. And I pause to, to call out the difference between health disparities and health inequities, um, because you can have health disparities for a variety of reasons. You can have health disparities because um, of biological reasons or things that make, you know, that, that, are, that are clear. Health inequities, um, in contrast, tend to be as a result of societal and, you know, political and other determinants of health, and therefore are considered more unjust and, and areas that we can advocate. So to the point that was made at the top of the hour, systemic racism has had a significant impact on how healthcare is delivered in this country. And so some of those, some of that legacy shows up in the health inequities that we see among different populations. Okay, that's a very helpful distinction and explanation. So uh, what's the shape of the ambition at Swedish? What what does it hope to uh, achieve? Our goal really is to have everyone thinking about how you can deliver care to all the different subgroups of people that you serve um, so that they can receive the care the way that you intended. Um, you know, one thing I call out is that clinicians, physicians, healthcare providers come into this work to serve people, to help people. And, and it's not their intention to have these, these gaps. And so the first thing to do is actually to recognize that there are gaps. So first, being able to look at data about outcomes and quality metrics and access and all those things that patients experience. And first recognize that there is a gap, because if you don't recognize it, you're not going to be able to yeah. do anything about it. So if you can filter, we, we, we look to filter our data by race, ethnicity, and language, also by sexual orientation and gender identity. And when you filter and disaggregate data in that way, what rises to the top is where you see the opportunities. Because you might, you know, if you're looking at a population, for instance, of um, in Native Americans, which is a small indigenous population that has a subset of the whole pop. Well, if you're doing well for the majority, you might not notice that you're not doing as well in this subgroup. So when you disaggregate the data, then you can say, oh, in this population, there is a gap. We're not performing as well in this group as we are with the, with the whole, with the majority. So the first thing is to actually begin to break down our data so we can identify where those opportunities are. And then when we can do that, start to think about how the care we deliver can be optimized for that subgroup. And I'll say as a clinician, as a clinician the first thing you think about is how much time do we have to, to make this difference, right? So can I really address all the social determinants of health in this patient population? But if you're not thinking about it, then no, you can't. But if you, if you have it at the back of your mind, that you need to bridge the gap. Then you start to identify who can be partners for you, who can be partners in the community, what other organizations can come alongside you to help you close the gaps that your patients might be experiencing. How can you change some of the policy that you have in place that may be creating or worsening disparities, you know, because we hadn't actually thought about it. So our goal is really that in every area of care that we deliver at Swedish, that we're thinking about how it's serving different populations, how it's impacting different populations and ultimately to not declare success in any health outcome until that success is true for every population. Very interesting. So the premise is that simply advancing awareness will lead to recognition of opportunities uh, and, and progress can ensue. Uh, can you give us any examples yet? Absolutely. So, and yes, simply advancing awareness helps. So for example, we're doing work in our primary care space on hypertension control in African-American populations. So when we look across our clinics, we found that some of our clinics had a gap in how well hypertension was controlled. And this is a metric that we report um, to third-party payers that's reported as part of our excellence index. But when we filtered it out, we found that, oh, in this subgroup of people, there might be opportunity. And so when we call that out, then you start to look at it and ask, well, what are the drivers of this difference? 
what, what is causing it to be different for this population versus the other? And so we start to identify drivers and start to put things in place to solve it. So one of the things we came up with is that we have a clinical pharmacist that works with us in our clinic. So maybe that clinical pharmacist can dovetail with the physician on, on visits and follow up with the patient to make sure that they have their refills, to make sure that they have, they have their follow-up appointment scheduled. That's a tiny example. I will mm -hmm. call out a big example, which you know, we've been talking about COVID-19, uh, you know, living through this hopefully once in a lifetime um, pandemic. Uh, and a year ago, we didn't know, this was just incoming, right? It, it's hitting us in so many ways. And we had to change healthcare quickly, rapidly, do things that uh, in ways that we hadn't done it before. Telehealth escalated. Um, we were able to have some people stay home, some people who had to go to work. And we're responding in real time to the challenge that we're facing. And as a pediatrician, I'll speak from, uh, from my professional vantage point. We're thinking, okay, the, everybody's talking about the grownups. What about the babies, right? How are we addressing the care of babies in this uh, pandemic? Okay, what we can do for them is make sure that we have a safe space for them to come to that we can keep their vaccine schedule you know, on track and so that we don't have them breaking out in mumps and, and diphtheria and other things that we've already controlled. So we're doing that. But a year out, we look back and we see, it turns out that there are these population of children who, for whom their vaccines were not kept as up-to-date as others. And those tend to be the children of uh, minority populations, right? And why? Because those populations were more disproportionately affected by COVID. Those were populations that had often more disproportionately had people that had to go out to work and therefore were more exposed and therefore were more challenged by the pandemic. And that starts to trickle down and you now see it in the children. So now when we look at that data, we're like, you know, with that, even with our best intentions, there is this population that we did not, we're not able to optimize care for. So how do we then, having identified this, begin to develop new strategies to address that? That's what data allows us to do and having this mindset of equity in the way that we deliver care because we're asking going back we're asking going forward we're asking in real time what this decision might mean for one population versus another okay now this connects to a question about given this charge you have in this position as the inaugural health equity officer i wonder what tools you have available to you to actually move Swedish in these directions. And <clears throat> I hear you articulating, uh, well, advancing awareness helps you uh, and the existence of data helps you. Um, what other uh, tools do you have in your kit what, what, to help advance this agenda across a very complex institution? Well, I would say that the biggest other tool that I have is an army of professionals across the organization who are committed to this goal. Uh -huh. And so my, my goal, my charge is to communicate, share opportunities, and I have people who will pick it up, right? So I talk to different service lines and I say, well, in this area that you're serving, is it in the women's clinic or is it in the cancer center? What are the opportunities that we have to, to identify inequities and bridge the gap? And you know, when I ask the question, a team steps up that says, you know, let's look, let's look at our data. Let's look at what our patients are saying, our issues. What are the things that we've known over time are concerned? And we identify initiatives in each area. And, and so I would say that my biggest tool is a lot of, is a, a very robust communication channel and sharing with everyone in the organization what our goals are getting people engaged, getting champions in each um, service area to focus on this work and, and, and bringing it together so people see what we're doing and continue to buy into the vision. The other good thing that, um, the other um, silver lining of this pandemic and the, the focus of, of um, that health systems have put on health equity is that there is a lot in the ether of best practices. There's a lot of research, there are a lot of toolkits, there are organizations who are you know, making roadmaps available that you can actually select from participating collaboratives, rinse and repeat, right? So the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, I like to call out 30 years ago, quality was something done in healthcare systems by 20 people in a basement. But with the um, Institute for Healthcare Improvement and bodies like that, bringing together experts across the country 
We now have best practices that pretty much every organization follows. And the health equity work, um, I believe, thankfully, is following a similar path where we're getting um, amalgamation of best practices from experts across the country that you can then take into your particular area and, and apply as, as applicable in your space. So we have toolkits, we have expertise that we share, and we have expertise that we bring in um, to do this work across Swedish. You know, that's enormously encouraging example because when I think about what you and your army of collaborators are trying to do uh, with great enthusiasm and skill, I, I picture it in the context of the harsh realities of healthcare, uh, you know, the enormous almost glacial inertia in healthcare, the often conflicting priorities of the various uh, constituencies, the patients, the providers, the payers, um, there are a lot of constraints, and yet uh, the, the quality example suggests that movement change is actually possible. Uh, but you must come up against uh, some of these constraints from inertia to, uh, to attitudes to other priorities. Uh, have you dealt much with that, or do you have a sense of, is this going to be a contest or a mutually agreed upon agenda? How do you think it's going to evolve? Well, it turns out that in healthcare, all of those exist simultaneously. It's a contest and it's a mutually agreed upon. <laughs> so, <laughs> good point. Very good point. Yes. Everybody says we have to do it. And well, how do we make it happen? What I want to call out, which I haven't set up until this point, is the very critical key in doing this work. And that is partnering with your community. Um, I, I think I mentioned it in passing, but it is really important that you partner with the, the communities that you're trying to serve and tap into the wisdom of, that, of those communities. One of the things that you've, you, you'll hear said is nothing for us without us. Because when we identify these gaps and disparities in, in, in healthcare in a particular community, it is critical that you have a conversation with that community to see what, what would they need? How can they help you close that gap? You cannot come in and declare that thou shalt because that you, you don't necessarily know what their, what their limitations or their challenges may be, but they do, and they give you the best ideas. So if we're looking to um, address a challenge in the, um, in the Latin population, a Latinx population, you wanna get with people who know that population, who are thought leaders and, and drive um, goals and, 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 and behavior in that group because they can tell you what, what is particular to that group that you need to think about as you're doing that work. So we, we think about that as we go across the body of work that we do. And what that does is allows you to potentially bring a win-win. So if I were to ask every clinician to, to solve for each problem, they might not be able to, you know, they surely don't have the time. But if they know that if you're facing a patient with uh, food insecurity, I know there's a food bank in this place, and I know there's this organization that I can do a warm handoff to who help my patients meet that need. I can meet their need through those partnerships, if you, if you understand what I mean. So partnerships are critical in understanding how we do this work and how we close those gaps, because the disparities like or the inequities, like I, I pointed out, are not due to biological differences between the groups. They are often due to social determinants, and you need partnerships right, right. to close to close those gaps. And those partnerships help you <laughs> because then you don't have to buy everything. You don't have to solve for everything yourself. And that helps to bridge some of the gap. The other thing though, is that there are some areas where, um, you know, there's by definition, uh, you know, there's systemic racism and structural challenges that have been built into the system. So one of big one that happened over the summer is that for years, the calculation for assessing kidney function had race as a factor in it. Mm -hmm. And because it had race as a factor in it, what, what the end result of it was that black patients, African-American patients ended up diagnosed later with worse outcomes, right? And on, when, until somebody insisted that, you know, look at this, there is not a biological reason for this to be a factor in it, right? And, and then change that. Having changed it, we've got the US Preventive Task Force has made the recommendation to change the calculation. You then have to put the resources into changing all your systems in the, you know, your labs and 
or the reporting systems to reflect that change. That's a cost that just has to be borne. We have to do it because we've identified this as something that we can do within. You don't need to, you know, there's not a partnership that's going to solve for that. That's something that we have to do because we've identified that there is an opportunity to improve here. So it, it's, they're all priorities and they're all challenges and we keep, you know, walking that tightrope because it's important. So if I hear you right, there's a, at least two general categories here. There, there are the established health care practices that need to be changed when things like kidney function or what other data point to uh, habits or, or traditions that are uh, uh, promoting inequity and they need to be changed. But I also hear about a whole array of social determinants of health uh, that are largely external to the healthcare system, but deeply impactful on uh, uh, the existence of inequities. So what's the bridge here between the inside and the outside of the healthcare system? Is, uh, uh, do you have roller skates to go out into the community? How, how, how are you approaching this? The bridge is awareness. Um, okay. you, know, you share what you know and you, you, you keep advocating for it. That's sort of why Swedish and now other organizations are calling out a role such as mine because somebody needs to keep the, 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 the keep their eye on the 30,000 foot, what the big picture is. But there are multiple aspects to this work that have to be brought along, um, along the way. Um, I, I think about the work that we did with mobile vaccine outreach um, in the, you know, once COVID vaccine became available. Swedish was one of the, um, the organizations that got, that had charged to give out vaccines early on. And we, because we had this perspective, started thinking early on, there are going to be some people and some populations for whom the booking online and trying to schedule, get a vaccine, you know, if you remember what it was like in January, click refresh and keep looking for where there's vaccines and if you're eligible, there are going to be some people for whom that's just not gonna work. They wouldn't be able to navigate either the digital platform or get time off work or be, you know, manage the language to get to it. So we started to work with our community partners to say, let's bring this vaccine to those vulnerable people in these populations who may not necessarily find it easy to get access to the vaccine. And so we started to do that. And we, we partnered with the YMCA. We, we, and how do we do something like that? With philanthropic support, we had help from our philanthropic partners who gave us you know, money, vehicles, wireless cradles, that sort of thing, to be able to get us out into the community to give the vaccine. So that, that for me is one model that actually encapsulates our ability to do this work in partnership, in the community, bringing together the resources that we have. There is never a time, as far as I can tell, that we're going to have all, all the resources we need for everything. But partnering with different groups allows you to, to amplify your impact in a way that you cannot do um, as, as a single institution. And so we have found great success with that model. And in going forward, you know, we did the first round of vaccines. We looked at the data and we're like, oh, there's this subgroup that isn't optimally targeted. Well, let's find organizations that serve this group and, and you know, refine our, uh, our strategy that way. And that's what we, we did. And so we were able to actually show movement in, in uh, vaccine coverage rates between different populations based on the criteria of who was eligible at that time. But, but that is a whole 360 degree approach that brings together the expertise in the organization and the expertise of the community, the partnership and the engagement and the generosity of philanthropy that allows us to be innovative in thinking about new ways to deliver health to people, that, to different populations that could benefit from it. You know, this is hugely uh, encouraging and uh, commendable to see this level of progress by this series of partnerships, whether it's with the community or with the philanthropic organizations or others. Uh, and it's especially encouraging because as, as Nick pointed out at the top of this, the pur purpose of Cambia Grove is to promote healthcare transformation. And those of us that that work in this arena realize that there are at least two elephants in the room. One is cost and the other is public policy. 
And so uh, your examples are suggesting that you don't have to sit around and wait uh, for changes in the way healthcare is financed or the public policy that governs much of it. But I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on uh, what might be needed in those arenas or and what are the constraints uh, financial and, and policy wise that, that uh, impede things in your judgment? Oh, um, how long do we have? Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in a healthcare system where everybody doesn't have equal access, financial is always gonna be a problem, right? And yet, if you wait until everyone has access to come to you, you're going to end up with you know, really expensive healthcare. And can we describe that that's where we're living today, right? So thinking about new ways to do this, where we go out and intervene and support people to be well, so that we're not constantly spending the money to treat them when they are sick, really is the way that healthcare has to go. Um, because then the financial burden is less, you know, less staggering. We, we still have a legacy of this system that is going to take us a while to rinse out. But if we start to think about delivering care in these new ways where you actually are reaching out to people in the community and, you know, if you think about the healthcare system, let me just take a step back. We built this ivory tower where we force people to, to come to us on our terms at our own time at the expense that we set. Well, you know, if you have other things in your life that are, that are driving you, that might not be the thing that you, you focus on at that point. And, and yet, when they get really sick, they must come to us. Now they're super expensive. Now, you know, the challenges become much more complicated. So this way of thinking about healthcare causes us to begin to go upstream and to go out to the community, to partner with the people who are willing to partner with us because they are, this is their home and these are their people. So they are willing to partner with us to bring information and resources to, to their communities. Um, so that, that's one way of, you know, in terms of the financial, and, and then, you know, maybe the entire country wins a lottery. But, you know, political, you know, the, 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 the regulatory and legislative bodies are struggling, right, with whose who's, uh, mindset or whose opinion is going to prevail. And the ability to model something and show, you know what, this is a way that we can do this at this cost. It's very helpful to our political leaders to be able to show them a model that has worked. So when we're able to do the mobile vaccine and, and show that this is a way to bring um, care to people at lower cost and with more impact, you could show that model to your legislative leaders and that helps them you know, to make the argument that they need to make to, to address the political determinants of, of people's health. So advocacy is a big part of, of getting this work done. And so we're constantly um, doing the back and forth. You're advocating and then you're modeling and using the models and the results to, to advance your advocacy. So yeah, that's the really, really short version of how do we solve for these two gigantic um, elephants in the room. Right, they are. So, you know, it, in the beginning, you uh, spoke about the uh, impact of data in helping identify opportunity. Uh, and now you and your partners are out actively making progress on various fronts in the equity sphere. Uh, are you able to collect data? Because it, your comments just now make me think that there may be the opportunity to confront policymakers, uh, funders, and so forth with data about uh, greater health equity actually is economically sensible uh, in many ways. Uh, and policy, um, follows can follow practice to some extent rather than lead it and so uh, do you have a, a plan to collect data along these lines absolutely um, because that is that is you know when you're doing anybody of work you're constantly thinking about sustainability and you establish sustainability by proving the value proposition of what you've put forward right so mm -hmm. as we're doing this work we've had to build some of these data systems to show that this is what it was like, this is what we did, and this is the return on that investment, right? Because you, you need to be able to tell the whole story so that the policymaker doesn't have to create the, the narrative in their head. And so as we're doing this work, we are actually very intentional about having the data guide us and having the data, the data um, report the impact that we're having so that we can tell the story so that this, this approach to healthcare can be propagated and be sustainable. So 
yes, in fact, that is that is a key aspect of what we're thinking about. So you mentioned the power of partnerships, uh, uh, not only with your office within others, with others within Swedish partners with uh, external communities, uh, with uh, philanthropists and so forth. What about uh, is there the potential for partnerships between health systems? Because this should be a shared agenda that should transcend the, the competition between health systems. Everybody benefits if we can raise the community level of equity. Indeed. And, and you know, I know we're better than here, right? Because we are all motivated to, to solve the problem for our community. And absolutely, health systems can and regularly and now are sharing, finding ways to share expertise. Like I said, there are a lot of collaboratives now on the national as well as the local area um, level. I think Washington State Hospitals Association has brought a bunch of health systems together to share best practices in this, um, in this right. area. Yep. So we, can, we certainly can do that so that each of us is not reinventing the wheel in our own silo while trying to serve the exact same population. You know, where most of our Swedish hospitals live, a few footsteps away is Virginia Mason, and right on the other side is, you know, we're all serving the same population. So it makes sense that we collaborate in doing that work. I will also call out a potential partnership in the land of Amazon and Microsoft of digital health, right? So digital solutions are being birthed every day in this space that could potentially allow us to scale our impact. So how do we connect with these large, really creative um, organizations who are thinking about this, right? And, and, and work with them so that they can bring to bear resources that we can deploy in service of the same population where we all live and work and you know, prove it and bring it you know, as a service to the, to the whole nation, to the whole world. They've done so much phenomenal work already. And I think it would be great to harness that intelligence and that opportunity in this space particularly um, that, we, that we can bring um, that, those partnerships to bear um, in service of health equity. You know, it's a good reminder about the hospital association. They really do have a track record of identifying opportunities for, for uh, best practices and moving them forward. So I'm delighted to think that they might be involved. Another organization that might be helpful related to the big tech and other companies is Challenge Seattle. I don't know if you know that group, but they're uh, headed by former governor, Chris Gregoire. And if we could have those business leaders articulate health equity as one of the priorities for improving our region, uh, that would maybe uh, advance that awareness that you were talking about uh, outside of healthcare organizations, uh, but more broadly and be very effective. Mm -hmm. So um, this is very encouraging. Um, so let's uh, not miss the opportunity if, if, for our audience to hear from you. Any recommendations to, uh, on your part about how they should think, what they should consider? Do you have suggestions about those uh, other practitioners or other people in the healthcare sector? Um, uh, what do you recommend that if we care about this, uh, how can we move beyond observer status? It's a great question. And, you know, the goal is to bridge the gap. And I, I describe it as the gap between the intention of the healthcare system and the ability of the, of the patient. What, is, what makes up that gap? Is, it made, is the person unable to take the best advantage of the care that you intend to provide because they can't get to you? because they can't make an appointment, because they can't get transportation. What are, what are the factors that are playing in this space? Um, is it a language barrier? Uh, is it a lack of cultural sensitivity or cultural humility in, in the way that we deliver care? And if you are going into healthcare thinking about centering the patient, because centering the patient and the community is really what health equity is about centering the person that you're trying to serve and understanding what it is that service to that person and that community needs. Oftentimes people will say, well, you know, I'm not creating a problem. I treat everyone the same. And my response is everyone does not need to be treated the same. Everybody has different oh. needs. And so you need to understand 
what does this particular person need? Is she a mom with three little children who can't make the appointment on time because she had to pick up the others from daycare before she got to you? And she arrives 10 minutes late and you turn her away because she was late. And this happens two more times. How many times do you think she's going to do that again, right? But if you, if you think about the patient and you think about what their needs are, then you can navigate the care that you deliver so that you, you make impact in a way that, that makes a difference in that particular patient's um, life. And if you think about a community who may not be able to take time off work when they're sick, right? And who may not be able to get to, to you and they can't refill their prescription. Is there a way that you can make it easier for them? And who can you partner with in order to do that? Um, because you can't own all of it. It's, it's a whole web that, that we have to create. But if you're thinking about it, then you can foster partnerships. You can build what we used to call a medical village um, of partners across your area who bring to bear some of the resources that the patients um, might, might benefit from. But if you're not thinking about it, then you, you get salty because she came late and you're upset because she's messed up your schedule and you turn her away and then you fire her from your practice and who have you served, right? So if you take a step back and center the patient, that's, that's really my message to everyone. Center the patient, center that community. Um, and if you're doing that, then you, you will be heading towards um, delivering more equitable healthcare. And then as a, as a uh, health industry, Let's go back and unravel some of these policies that we've put in place that create these gaps. You know, let's look at things like um, renal function, uh, EGFR rates. Let's look at vaginal birth after cesarean section calculus. There's a whole bunch of calculations that have race as a part of it. Can we look at all of those and unravel them so that we, you know, we're bringing everyone else, everyone to a more level playing field? There's a historical construct that we have to go back and take apart, but there's also the real-time needs of the populations that we have to serve. And we have to be thinking about all those things. And the solution is to center the patient. You center the patient, we can get it right. Fascinating, fascinating indeed. And I, it, your mind races off to all the different partnerships that might be possible, even within the healthcare se uh, sector. We've seen a rising influence of pharmacists, for example, and uh, they, they can very much be part of this kind of thinking and, and in partner with other health providers. Super encouraging. Well, we salute you for the undertaking this. This is an ambitious agenda that you have, and uh, it's really fun to hear your thinking. And, uh, and we uh, salute Swedish for the, taking this initiative. So I think it's time to turn to our audience and see what questions they have for you. Nick, have you been able to accumulate some? Uh, it's hard to hear you, Nick, when you're muted. There, there we go. <laughs> uh, we have a, a number of questions from the audience and my, my challenge here will be synthesizing them uh, to, to make, you, make sense of them all, but there's so many in our time remaining. I think one theme that we're seeing in questions that I've gotten offline is around your story, Dr. Nyoku, and, and Clearly, this is such existential work that you're doing and, and quite the challenge. How, how do you keep going in the face of, of this systemic um, issue that, that we're taking on? What motivates you to, to keep going? Ooh, yeah, big <laughs> <laughs> I think um, that I've always thought of my work as service. I've, I've thought about it as something, a gift that I'm responsible to bring to the world. And so... Um, that's the way I think about it. I think that I, I have to serve because I'm called to serve. And therefore, sometimes it's hard, especially having some of these conversations can be really hard. Um, but, you know, you take a step back, you, you focus on self-care, take a few minutes to take deep breaths wherever you can, you know, and, and just keep going, recognizing that it's, it's, it's a service. It's, it's, it's what you have to do. Yeah. Oh, well said, and yeah, well said. goodness, yeah. we're fortunate to have have you and Swedish leading that that charge here uh, in, in this territory. Um, so one question I'll, I'll field here. Thank you, Laura Ritterman, for this. Uh, she asks, I noticed that more and more of the medical shows are tackling some of these issues. Grey's Anatomy just had a great storyline about a Black patient being denied a kidney transplant. To what extent do these storylines help educate the general population? They are so helpful. I mean... 
this past 18 months has been some of the hardest time for all of us just in general, particularly in healthcare. But the one silver lining has been the reckoning that society has come to deal with. We have to talk about this. This is not new. There is lots of um, literature out there and articles and, and reports and papers of these things happening to people. And yet when you start to talk about it, folks look at you like that, there's no way that happened. But when it happens on TV, it becomes real, right? Mm. So when it shows up on Grey's Anatomy, it's real. When it shows up in, 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 in places where people engage with in a way that's accessible to them, it makes it more real. And so then they become more, they become stronger advocates because now it, it's accessible to them in a way that they can speak to. So I am very thankful for just popular culture really signing on to say we will, this is what we are willing to do as our part, and that's to get the word out. A, a couple of questions have touched on this and, and dovetailing off of Laura's question. How, how, how do we reckon with the gross, gross racism of our past, particularly in the healthcare profession? Dr. Nyoko and I had a, a short conversation around this with a, a book called Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington. And uh, in my view, it's a central reading in this, in this space. I'm sure we'll see a lot of nods if we were all in person around that title. Um, but in order to know, Dr. Nyoko, where we're going, how do we reconcile the past? Is popular culture uh, a vehicle with which we can do that? Or how would you uh, wrestle with, with that tension? It's uh, all of the above, right? Because that tension is difficult. When you start to have the conversation, people resist because they feel attacked and they feel uncomfortable. But we have to sit in that discomfort and just acknowledge that this is what it is. I didn't say you did it, it just, is right and yeah. we have to be able to have that conversation so that we can take it apart so that we can start to unravel it if we try to paint it over like we've done all it does is perpetuate the problem so uh, you know i i make no bones about the fact that these discussions are difficult because people who are trying to do the best they can coming up against a system in which this stuff has been baked into the pie you then find that you've been perpetrating the, the disparities and that was not your intent. So that's that's uncomfortable. And that, that takes some reckoning for you as an individual or as a healthcare system, but that's what we have to do. Um, you know, we didn't, you know, we, we, we didn't go into it with that intention, but this is what that history has meant. This is what redlining has meant. This is what, you know, all these different calcul calculations have meant. This is how we arrived at this point. And if you don't call it out, then you can't roll it back. And so we have to be, be willing to sit in the discomfort, you know, to have the conversation so that we can begin to, to address those things. And I'm looking to, to Kimberly's question here, which I think gets to this exact point you're making. And I don't want to belabor it if you don't have anything to add to that, because that's a terrific answer, Dr. Nyoku. But uh, her, her question asks, can you speak to an individual's responsibility and understanding their biases and lived experiences that may be potential barriers to addressing health equity? Uh, and how is Swedish addressing that specifically? Biases are so key, right? So one of the ways that, uh, the example that, that, that's that been in the press a lot, which is very real, is how African-Americans are often not believed when they complain of pain, right? Uh, and, and that's just, it, it's become part of the lexicon and it's, it's the bias that people have. And so because you're not believed, then the, the things that, the pathways that that information would have led your care team are blocked off. They don't then do further investigation. They don't give you pain meds and all of that sort of thing. And then you have bad outcomes. Um, but, but the conversation that we have at Swedish is that everybody has bias. Bias is what has kept us alive, right? Bias is what helps you to judge an, a situation instantly um, to determine whether you're in danger or you're not. So that biologically is the case. But what has fed that bias is a lot of the narrative and a lot of the policies over generations. So what we ask people to do is just take a pause. When you find yourself making a, a, a judgment about something, pause and take a deep breath and ask yourself, is this true or is that what I think, right? Is this really, is, is my bias reflecting real danger or is it reflecting my historical um, narrative? And that takes work. And so we are across the organization, you know, starting to work with our teams to address and recognize implicit unconscious bias and how that shows up in the way that we care for 
not just our, our patients, but also our care team, right? Because, you know, people who are providing care to patients are also subject to some of those biases. And how do we address that in such a way that they feel empowered and, and equipped to continue to do the work the best they can? Yeah, there's a famous t-shirt that might help. It says, stereotypes are a real time saver. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and then they create uh, all sorts of other things from those stereotypes. Absolutely. Right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. upstream of a lot. Um, reading one question here in the chat, I think this is reflective of other sentiment here as well. Um, Melina asks, I'm a nurse practitioner and doctoral student with a future project focusing on health equity. My local hospital in a rural community, and I'll editorialize that not unique to rural and necessarily here, rural health no, no doubt needs a refined focus, but we've seen that here certainly in, in Western Washington, um, that this, in, in Melina's example, the rural hospital does not have a health equity officer, council, or committee. What do you recommend she does to bring health equity into that, that local hospital uh, from a partnership to, uh, and, and form a partnership to complete her project? Any advice? She's a student, but I will say the first thing you do in any of this work is form a coalition of the willing, right? So who is in a space who's willing to be a partner with you, who's willing to be, uh, you know, a champion of this work? And, and a lot of work that we do in healthcare is guided by influence. And so if she's a student, you know, maybe she can connect to the, um, the quality department because they have data. Data is always your, your best tool, right? And you're like, you know, can we look at this and can we just filter it and see if we can have, if we can see opportunities here? Um, because people always resist until you show them the picture. So there, there are partnerships that you might want to form and, and start to have those discussions and start to illuminate the concern for people. Because when they see it, and when it, then it becomes real to them. Um, but prior to that, it's an abstract concept that people are talking about. And if you're in a rural or maybe critical access hospital and you're thinking of all kinds of other priorities, that might not be your first. But there is data. And even if you don't have it in the hospital, the, the um, public health in the county is very helpful at gathering data like that. And you can get information that can illuminate, even if it's just your geographic area, even if not the particular hospital. But between that sort of source of data and the quality team in the hospital, you can generally find some advocates who will come alongside you and, and help you to advance your cause. Now, you touched on this with Lee earlier, and I don't need to cover, cover old ground here, but maybe to ask this in a slightly different way. And, and partnerships, uh, rightfully, are such a, a great conduit for so many of our solutions, probably across all categories. Um, but thinking as well and, and drilling down more specifically, perhaps around value-based care and how that those incentives might be better aligned to, to not only include uh, seemingly disparate partners um, in, in collaborations, but also include them in the financial model as well. Is that something um, Swedish is, has, has explored already? You have some examples to share or some future aspirations in that space? Thank you for calling out value-based care. Value-based care is going to be <laughs> the solution to health equity because it forces everybody to be invested in the success of every group, right? Because if you have, you're, you're responsible for this whole population and this subset of them have, you can close the gaps by targeting, you know, improving the performance in that group then the whole system is motivated to, to put some resources um, towards that. And, and yet, to Lee's earlier point, it's a competition, right? Because there, there's, there's still X amount of resources. So identifying partnerships and other organizations who can come alongside you to help to close those gaps would be a, a great way to do that work. So in some areas of the country, you know, you, you, you want to... Um, target African-Americans for prostate screening, for instance, prostate cancer screening. Well, maybe you should go to the barber shops, right? And, and have those spaces where they are listening and, and hearing, share that information. But as you do that, you're improving your screening rates, which is how your value-based contracts are, are measured. So then because you have that perspective, it, it, it motivates um, different parts of the organization to come alongside and be partners in the work. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And Lee, of course, feel free to jump in with any, any thoughts of your own. Um, here are other questions. As, as I'll just call out, as Laura, my colleague, uh, noted in our chat, we did launch a poll that you can see here. Thank you for filling that out. That really helps us uh, understand uh, the impact here and how we can continue the conversation most effectively uh, for those in the room. We reference an event coming up on the 18th with Dr. Nyoku's colleague, Mardia Shans, uh, who's the Chief DEI Officer at Swedish 
Um, so I'll put a link into that here and we'd love to see you in that room as well. We'll spend 90 minutes diving deeper still uh, into these wonderful conversations and important conversations. So we hope to see you in that room as well. And that'll be recorded and shared if you can't join us in real time. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn to, to one question posed here by Daniel. So who do you think is responsible for a patient's daily health? Employers, doctors, and I'll add any, anyone else? <laughs> How about all of the above? <laughs> <laughs> Employers, you know, want their, their employees to have the resources to be well and to be present and to perform and be productive. You know, doctors want you to have the tools you need to, to be healthy and stay well and to heal you when you get sick. You want to be healthy and be able to engage with your family and have strength and be, and, and, and be active and do the things you need to do. Society has a responsibility to also support you so that you, you don't have to slay every dragon yourself. So you have a way to feed your family and support and feel safe and secure, right? And so we are all invested in this thing together. And there's the one thing, one of the things that we learned is that everybody's outcome impacts everybody else. You know, we may have erroneously thought that we could live in our gilded tower and because I can afford to be healthy and safe, then it doesn't matter what anybody else can. Turns out that's not true because we are all invested in having a healthy, strong society. And so being equitable in the way we deliver quality care and, and the way that we support communities to be healthy, it serves us all. So I think it's everybody's um, responsibility to work together towards you know, a more equitable health society. Yeah, I, I'm fond of a quote of the late Senator Paul Wellstone who said, we all do well when we all do well. Uh, and I think it just speaks to that sort of collective impact that uh, we all need to, to recognize that inner interconnectedness of, of everything, especially especially in these these times. Um, goodness, well, turning to to another great question from the audience, and this is is thematic. And I, 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 at the risk of of asking a similar question for a similar answer, Dr. Nyoko, I, I will because I think it just underscores kind of that that crucial point where we are uh, as a healthcare system and probably as a society. Uh, but the question reads, how can one attempt to mindfully integrate DEI principles into performance management and goal setting for development in an organization as sprawling as Swedish? How can I encourage colleagues and managers from staff to clinicians to administrators to be more competent leaders in this space? So DEI work is a key ingredient in achieving health equity. And so in a healthcare system, Having a, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of your lens allows you to be intentional about creating an inclusive work environment where people can bring their whole selves to work. We know that data says that patients who are served by you know, con concurrent providers right, do better. So if you have a diverse patient population, you do better by having a diverse provider and, and caregiver population. But ultimately, it's going to take forever to be able to match one patient to the, each provider that, that, that matches their, their race, their identity, um, however they define it. But when you have diversity in your workplace and in your, work, uh, in your, in your employee pool, then you, you build cultural humility because people are not living in a space where they only see others that look like them. They start to learn that there are other perspectives and cultures and, and, and ways of living that they need to recognize and respect. And when they are able to do that, then that respect and that humility translates into the care that they're providing for their patients because they become more sensitive to how different groups might receive care or might need to receive care. Um, so beginning to have that conversation across any organization ultimately serves you, right? Because if you don't have that focus, sometimes people will say, oh, I'm going to hire a diverse uh, provider, a, a diverse physician. And then you bring them in and they're the only, and the environment is not welcoming. Well, within a short time, they'll exit because you haven't made that space um, inclusive and welcoming to them. So um, as an augment, and, and, and then the, the patients that they would have served lose, the people who would have learned from them lose. So really thinking as an organization, how do you start to do this work? And on the 18th, when you talk with uh, my, my diet partner, Maria, she can tell you in great detail some of the work that we're doing at Swedish. So I'd rather not steal her, th her thunder. But just to say that being able to have that lens and, and address bias and have people start to think about those, those things in their daily work ultimately leads you to have more equitable um, healthcare for our patients and communities. 
Yeah. Oh, well said. I'm glad we're recording this. We'll, we'll have to clip many of <laughs> these mm -hmm. Dr. Noko and, mm -hmm. and share this with them widely. Um, I have a couple more questions here, but Lee, anything you'd want to add as we as we get to our at the top of the hour? No, you know, I'm I'm struck, uh, frankly, Dr. Anilko, by your ability to integrate your experience, your personal sense of a dedication to service, uh, your accumulated wisdom, and a very articulate perspective. Um, so you're an ideal candidate for this inaugural role and. And I want to express my gratitude uh, to you for coming and sharing all that with us, because this is an important work in an important season, and we all need to be engaged in it. So I'm very grateful. Thank you. Well, then I'll ask uh, just kind of a, a for last remarks here, then Dr. Dr. Nyoku, and I'll I'll tee you up with this, and please uh, take this any direction you'd like. Lee touched on this at the, earlier in the hour. But we have a room here of 85 innovators from across the spectrum of healthcare. What would you challenge them with as they leave this conversation today to think about in the near term and what longer term ambition uh, would you want them to take their talents and focus them on? I would like every single person to pay attention to the fact that all healthcare is not received in the same way. Everyone, all different populations don't experience healthcare the same way, regardless of our intentions. And so it is important that we are intentional about assessing the way that our efforts are being received in, uh, or how they're impacting different groups. And that effort could be from what the environment looks like. Do we have art that reflects the different populations that we serve, right? In every aspect of healthcare, you can make an impact, but you need to just take your little slice of the pie and ask yourself, how is the work I'm doing impacting different populations you know, today? How is the work I'm thinking about doing potentially going to impact different populations? And how is what I've done in the past? Or how has that already impacted different populations? And when you start to look at that from whatever perspective you come at it from, if you're, if you're IT or your, um, what do you call them? Electronic medical record people, how, how is that documented? How do you capture race? How do people have the opportunity to share with you their sexual orientation or gender identity? Does that show up and how can I change that? If you're nutrition services, do we have a range of foods that, that makes people recognize that you, you see them? The one thing human beings want in this world is to be seen and to be appreciated and understood. So how in your slice of healthcare are you seeing your patients and, and having your work impact them? When you start to think about it that way, then each one of us can bring uh, what we can from our own slice of healthcare delivery and ultimately build a more equitable, high quality health system in service of our patients and community. Goodness, well, can't add or detract <laughs> to that, that closing statement there, Dr. Nyoku. Um, so I won't endeavor to do so. Lee, any, any final words as we, as we wrap no, up? I would, I would just uh, call on all of us to hear that last summary that Dr. Nyoku just gave. That's what I would call actionable wisdom. Uh, that's a very wise perspective, but it's also something we can pursue individually in our own spheres. So thank you for the encouragement uh, that you bring to all of us. Thank you for having me. This was a lot Truly. of fun. <laughs> Our pleasure, Dr. Yonyoku, and we'll look forward to continuing the conversation in many forms for, for many months to come. Uh, thank you for, for taking us to this, this place here and, and these directives that we can carry forward. Really appreciate having you in this community and having you in Western Washington for those that live in this area. What a pleasure. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Bye now.